Um, for those who don't know Glenn, because uh, this is posted on my forums, in fact, there's a lot of people in my forums who don't know me, um, but there's always new members. So um, for the benefit of new members and, uh, and my forums who don't know Glenn yet, um, I'm Felix Konomakis. I'm a psychologist with an interest in other therapies, clinical hypnosis, etc. And I run uh, the Parent Forum, the Adult Forum. I trained Glenn about four or five years ago. Yes, Glenn, that's right. Yeah. Years ago. yeah, time flies. Yeah. Um, in Australia. Um, Glenn is based in Melbourne. Uh, we both do remote therapy. Um, and Glenn has now become probably the most experienced ARFI practitioner since that time in, in Australia. Um, I think you told me the other day you just tipped the thousand client mark, yep. which is actually really impressive because I've been doing this for like 14 years. It took me a few years to hit 1,000. Um, okay, I, I started building momentum after it, but Glenn, you just sort of launched in there. So you're actually outpacing, <laughs> well, you know, so uh, enough time. But um, so Glenn has seen a lot of people, um, a lot of experience, and a lot of also the younger children as well, which is going to be really uh, important. Because you have a lot of experience of that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's it for introductions. Um, let's go straight to questions. So these are questions mostly from my uh, the parent forum here, which asks. There's been some new questions since we talked about these collated these. So if we have time, then the session will go through them. Yeah. So, um, but you know, don't worry if you've asked questions and we haven't um, seen them. Um, we will do another. We'll do another one of these, and hopefully get the tech uh, handled. So, yeah, good. People are saying they can hear you. So I'm switching to my um, questions, and hopefully you won't mess up the video. So um, here we go. Question number one, no particular order. Uh, the question was about helping parents of our children who say they don't want to change what to do. Um, I often find that social modeling is quite a useful thing here. Um, children follow the lead of other children, their peers, especially people they respect. And nowadays it's it's people they see on social media has a great pull on them. So what I tend to do is I've got a, a YouTube channel with um, 200 before and after treatments. A lot of them uh, are with children. So I say, you know, get your child to watch the YouTube channel and see that, oh, this boy's just like me, this girl's just like me, they have the same blocks, and they're eating food at the end. They can do it, I can do it. Um, and so, so that's one thing, is just you know the soft approach, that there's people out there with the right therapies who can help you. Um, I would like to say, before I hand over to Glenn on this, that there's a difference between um, children who want to change but are scared, as opposed to children who don't wanna change. They're two very different things. If a child says, you know, I'd really like to eat this, it smells good, but I've just got this block, there, there may be a client for change. A child who says, I'm happy where I am, I don't want to see anybody, is not a client for change. Yeah. So, Glenn, over to you. Um, yeah, I, I think they're all good points. So, you know, the, the question is really, parents are frustrated. They love their kids. Mm -hmm. uh, they want the best for their kids. Uh, how do we get our children to change or to recognize that change is necessary? And, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room that for a certain age of child, and typically we're talking under eight, under seven, you know, they may not be cognitively aware, A, that they've got a problem. So that's the first mm -hmm. challenge. Uh, here's a nice thing, and Felix has already mentioned it. There are enough videos of Felix, and there's an animated video that I've created that you can gently show your child. And one of the nice things of feedback that I've received from children that have seen Felix videos and mine is for the first time in their life. They've come to realize that it's not just them, there's other people in the world like them. It's taken a little bit of pressure off them and all of a sudden they've stopped feeling hyper anxious and yes, there's a way forward. Now here's the thing, if you show the child the videos and they turn to you and say, mom, why am I watching this? This has got nothing to do with me. Well, that really highlights that you know the child's not ready and they don't recognize yeah. that they've got an issue. But if they say, gee, mum, that looks like me or that sounds like me, that opens the door for conversation and that's a really gentle way to start. Yeah, yeah. They need to see it's possible because yeah. they said seeing is believing. So, yeah, so that's one way. And um, by the way, um, I, we've both done a What is Arthur YouTube video and Glenn just improved everything I've said. And, uh, you know, he, he's added everything, made it really comprehensive. 
it's got like over 60,000 views. It's, it, I'm sure it's the most watched Alfred explanation and it really is brilliant. It, it's an evolution from what I did. So if a child um, or, or parent or anybody wants to know what is Alfred, well, watch both our videos, but especially watch Glenn's because it's actually really good. <laughs> I should have organized all my information, put it that way. Instead. And, and, and the doodly pie is, um, is a really good way of explaining it. Yeah. Again, you, know, uh, it, you put a lot of work into the doodle thing and made it really accessible. So that's great. Yeah. So second question about young children between five and seven. Um, Glenn, I'm going to defer to you on this because I'm, I have seen six, seven year olds but I'm now a little bit stricter with at least a mature eight, nine year old. Um, so over to you. All right. Um, and as I'm talking here, Felix, we're going to touch on other answers, but, but that's OK. Mm. Other questions. That's a really challenging age. You know, when we're talking about children that are under eight, under seven, so sort of that between four and seven mark, it, it's not the child's fault. They're, they're cognitively just not at the right stage for change. But I, here's a nice thing, you know, typically most behavior is learned. And that's an interesting concept because somehow in that child's life, they've learned a particular behavior around food. Their body has learned to distrust food for whatever reason it is. So if they can learn to do that, then part of the therapy we provide is the opportunity to learn something different. And the therapy is a nice way to explain to a client, whether it's a young child or not, what is happening and give them the opportunity to change. Here's the challenge though, when we've got a young child who's four or five or six, you know, what are they interested in? Some of those children are not even aware they've got a problem. And as parents, yeah. and Felix, you and I are parents, we like to protect our kids, we like to make sure they're looked after. Conversely, that creates more of an issue for Arford. The more we protect our children, the more we bubble wrap them, the less likely they are to come into contact with situations where they say, oh, I'm a little bit different to that person at that party that I went to. So the longer they live yeah. in their bubble, the less likely they are to recognize change. Yeah, I, I have had children a bit older and I said, you know, what, you know, socially could be a problem to say, all my friends know about it, all my friends are really supportive, which is really nice. But it does mean that there's no incentive for them to change until some problem happens for them later on. Um, so, yeah, with young children, the cognitive thing is very important. I have had children brought in. You know, I, I send a 20 page A4, I can't make it longer, it's already too long, email saying, you know, check the child is ready, check this, check this. And I still get parents come in and they plonk a child saying, there's my child, do the hypnosis yeah, thing. Yeah. And the child's looking around and talking to them going, what's that? Is that you? Who's this? This is me doing an aeroplane. I'm, I'm just looking at the parent going, what were you thinking? Yeah. You know, this yeah. child doesn't have more mature um, focus and comprehension than normal. You yeah. know, it's a proper six-year-old baby, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, it's really important. It's not just, th there's still this idea which touches on our next question. We do some kind of medical treatment, like receiving a shot or something. Do you turn up? We do something, you know, can you see my two-year-old? No, you know, two-year-old is not, doesn't have any cognitive capacity to understand the thing we're saying. No. You know, you can see a two-year-old and inject them with something. You can't do this kind of therapy with a two, three, four-year-old. Yeah. Um, it, it's not something that's done to a child. The child is an active participant to some degree. Um, so um, th this is really important. We keep saying it, you know, over and over again, the expectations about the therapy. <clears throat> so with, with young children, six, seven-year-olds, um, I think you've got the stage where it's 50-50 with me, whether it's going to work or not, depending on the maturity of the child. Yeah. I, I don't really, I know other people would be delighted with a 50-50 success rate. You know, there are people doing weeks and weeks of therapy saying, my, my daughter touched the grape and licked the grape, we're delighted. That's not good enough for me. No. You know? um, I want a child tasting food at the end of the session, different foods, and 50-50, sometimes, you know, 40% uh, success rate with the really young ones, just, it's not nice for me to work that way. And I'm used to, you know, over 90 as you are yeah. with older children and adults. So um, that's where I stand with young children. Far better to wait. And I, we have said this, I think, in other ways. There is this idea that a child will, oh, I've got a six child who's only eating chicken nuggets and chips. And if I don't see you soon, he'll die. That's just not true. You and I, Glenn, We've seen so many people in most appalling diets in their late twenties, and it still doesn't show. Yeah. N not to say it won't be a problem for everybody, but it's better for a child at four, five, six to wait till they're 
8, 9, 10, 11, and, and, and rather than rush it. Yep. Because the bodies are very resilient. They can cope with a very bad diet for a very long time. The, the, you know, take that pressure off. Um, there's always going to be an exception. But in most cases, you know, what does your seven-year-old eat, um, your nine-year-old eat? Just chicken nuggets and fries. What's the health like? They're actually quite good. It's got tons of energy. The GP cleared them. You think, yeah, you know, that they're, they're resilient. So hang in there. Um, well, let me just jump in there, Felix, if we I can. We come to the next question. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. I think a lot of, lot of clients uh, come to both of us who have been through other types of therapies, particularly for younger children. There's occupational therapy. Uh, maybe there's some issue with the mouth, uh, some sort of um, trouble mm. eating. Maybe there was a tongue tie earlier on. So there's dietitian, there's OT. Sometimes uh, they've gone through SOS therapy. Uh, they've gone through exposure therapy. So yeah. a lot of clients do ask us with younger children, we've taken our child through all of these various therapies and nothing has really worked. And Felix, you'll you'll speak on this in a moment, but yeah. the, the intrinsic part is for whatever reason, and let's imagine a young child crawling along the ground, you know, they're only uh, 10 or 11 months old. And for whatever reason, there's a candle yeah. on a small table and they crawl up, they've never seen it before and they put their finger straight in the candle and it burns them and it leaves them with a blister and they start crying and they crawl away. Something within that child has recognized that that thing is not pleasant for them and is quite dangerous. And if yeah. nothing happens to change that opinion, for example, if they do it again, uh, then all of a sudden there's something happened within that child that they'll begin to resist going near the candle. Now, for whatever reason it is, yeah. food, food is an issue for the child. It, it's a learned response. So if we do food exposure, SOS therapy, if we do CBT, we go into dietitians or OT, unless that internal subconscious fear is somehow reduced or changed, then no amount of that other yeah. therapy, in, in my opinion, is going to help the child in the long term. Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid I agree with that. Um, and the nice thing about this, you know, people say, um, we're going off topic here, it's not on the list. Um, people say, your child really has to be ready. And th that's, a, that's a complex answer um, because I, I have, it's important to start off remembering the subconscious mind likes clear instructions. And if it's clear about what you want it to do, we talk about this healthy way path, it will do it. Even if the child himself, their conscious mind is skeptical. I've had countless teenagers, for example, um, I've done my therapy coming up the last bit where I formally asked for change. And I say, you know, right now, how much do you believe that your mind will make the changes for you today? And I see a child go, I don't think they'll do it. No, why not? Because I've had therapy for years, nothing's worked. Why will this work? And I said, okay, well, let's see. So I said, are you willing to tell your mind to do this? Yes, I am. And, you know, the, the first time I did this, I didn't think it was going to work. I was just running out of time, didn't have a plan B. So I said, well, okay, well, well, let's finish the therapy. Let's do the last part. And I did it, much to my surprise, the child was eating all the foods. I was surprised, the parents were surprised, the child was surprised. It goes to prove the subconscious mind says, if you tell me to do this, I will do it. Yeah, but you're really going to do it. If you tell me to do it, I'll do it. Yeah. So if you explain it to your mind in a clear way, it understands it will do it. Yeah. So you don't need to be totally believing in the therapy. You don't need to be totally um, positive. Y you can be wanting to change and skeptical is absolutely fine. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't write that child around or off. Um, you don't have to be out oh, because Glenn, I'm sure you've had the same. Oh, my child's really enthusiastic. He's been talking about seeing Felix or Glenn for three weeks and they come to the, the session, they, they shut down. Yeah. And it's like a completely different child. Yeah. And the parent says, who is this child? I mean, you've been so excited. Now you look bored. You look unengaged. You look around the room. You're not paying attention. You're yawning. And it's like you're a completely different child because when push comes to shove, the child says, oh, in the future, I'm going to change. But now I'm here and I've actually got to do the work. And it's a bit scary. Oh, avoidance. You know, right. Avoid. Yes. Um, it's that knee jerk reaction to avoid. And then they, they, they shut down. So it's really hard with children. Being super positive, enthusiastic doesn't mean they're going to change in the session. And being skeptical doesn't mean uh, that they won't change the session either. Um, that's why we say it's a bit of a lotto. It's a bit of a gamble. With kids, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, can you help my child? I don't know. You know, I do my therapy and I see what happens. Yeah. Is my answer. So uh, I think um, in in view of some parents losing hope at this point in time, I think we need to come back to it. 
uh, you know, there's there's five or six thousand clients being seen over a period of years. So with, with clients that are you know 14, 15 plus, there's a really high chance of success. Really, there's no concern there. It's ninety percent plus. Yeah. What we're talking about, Felix, is and there's a middle there's a middle range between about ten or eleven and yeah. about twelve or thirteen. That, that's a reasonably successful uh, type of client. Yeah. I think we really need to delineate that we're to really talking about the nine years and under, you know, that sort of six to nine. Yeah. That, that is the difficult age for children. Yes, we can help, but we really don't yeah. have, you know, the, the 90 plus percent success rate. And we're always honest with our, our clients to say, listen, it's probably 60 or 70. It's still good, but we just don't know if your child might be. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 So would you rather risk a sort of 40, 50 percent success rate now? Wait a couple of years, make it 70 and yeah. 80. Yeah. And that's the plan. Okay. So, um, okay, expectations of therapy and uh, why therapy may have a flow on effect on benefit to other therapies they're exploring. Um, I, I'm going to ask you to talk about the flow benefits, uh, uh, Glenn. For my part, parents will say to me, you know, okay, you know, we had the session, great. Um, and he's easy, he or she has eaten, but can you do the hypnosis next time? You know, and I, I have done a recent thing on my uh, on the forum to explain this people still think the hypnosis is the medical treatment I was saying it just doesn't work like that um, you can't if you know for good hypnosis to happen you need a good client you need a client who's willing open receptive and um, you know pretty good at imagination pretty good at being hypnotizable most children aren't open and receptive even when I see them relaxing they catch themselves relaxing and open their eyes just in case I hypnotize them so what they're saying is, I want you to hypnotize me to change as long as you don't hypnotize me. Now, that's an impossible goal. So the child wants to feel in control, despite you know what we might be saying, like you're in control. Um, it's scared of the new stuff. It d doesn't want us to kind of feel like it, we're, we're manipulating uh, the child. And it wants to be relaxed and then hypnotized. You know, it just it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So I developed this open version where the majority of therapy is done in the setup, in the lead up to the hypnosis. So hypnosis, I say to a person, are you here to be hypnotized or here to change? Because this is about getting you to change. And all these things work together to convince your mind to change whether you're hypnotized or not. So this is the difficulty because I, you and I have hypnosis backgrounds. We've taken the knowledge from that, but we do a sort of post-hypnosis approach here. And I, I understand why if you're a lay person, this is difficult to understand. Because you're thinking, well, when are you doing the hypnosis thing? We're going to compel my child to eat. And we don't do that therapy. I know endless, literally hundreds and hundreds of people who have tried mainstream hypnosis, even were hypnotized, and it didn't work. I just put up a thing where somebody had two years of hypnosis. It didn't work. And one session changed. It wasn't that. So it's not about reaching some magical state that will compel you to change. We've got to change that old myth. But people are still hoping for that. And they get disappointed when it doesn't happen, you know. Um, Felix then hypnotized, you know, just asked my son to have their eyes open and closed and did talking, and then you know they ate a little bit of food or something. Like, well, because it's all done the negotiation, everything else, the reframing, all the other skills you and I know we're doing in the background. So that that's something that is going to be an ongoing um, sort of myth busting thing uh, about how we actually do this approach and why it works, and it's not reliant on hypnosis. Yeah. So that's really important. Over to you, Ben. Yeah, yeah I think um, an interesting example following on that, and, and I will talk about the other therapies, is, you know, let, let's imagine there's a, um, a a man, a mythical man that we know, and, and he doesn't cry much. He, he's, he's pretty stoic. Yeah. He's pretty strong. But he's sitting down in front of the television, and a movie comes on, and all of a sudden he starts to get emotionally connected to that movie. Now, he's not in hypnosis, but all of a sudden he, he's, he gets a little tear in his eye. He starts to feel emotion. Mm. And he starts crying. Now, we could look mm. at that person and say, what changed for that person? And that's very much like the therapy that we do. We're not putting the client into hypnosis, but by engaging yeah. with the client in a very specific way and in a very emotional yeah. way, we begin to get a response, even though their eyes are open. It's just like that man watching television. He's not in hypnosis, but he's having an emotional response. Yeah. And Felix, exactly. you might agree that many clients who we see in fact, shed a tear at some point yeah. because it is yeah. quite an emotional release that they go through in the therapy session. Yeah. 
this is this is um, this is why it's possible to do some without a formal hypnosis. So if you're watching Star Wars and you're already getting into it, you think, oh, I hope Luke or the Mandalorian is okay. You think they're all actors. There's cameras, because there's no lightsaber. There's no power source that could power that lightsaber. You know, it's all rubbish. But in the moment, we suspend uh, disbelief and we believe what we get engaged in this experience yeah. and we care about the characters, even though rationally we know they're all actors. So we're looking for that kind of thing, some emotional engagement. Yes. And you don't need, you know, hypnosis or proper buying. You know they're actors, but you suspend this and you can go along with this narrative. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this question led us to, okay, uh, we have a therapy that we've seen many thousands of clients. And you know what? Um, is it a standalone or is there some additional benefit? When I first started and, of course, learned from Felix, I, was, I went in saying this is the therapy and this is the only thing. And then, you know what, after a little while, and I've spoken to Felix at length about this, parents would come back to me and say, you know what, uh, we, we saw you for that therapy, Glenn, and, and there was some change there. It was really nice. But we continue to do some exposure therapy or some OT as well because, you know, we, we're on a, on, on a train of doing that. Yeah. And here's what we noticed. After we did your session, all of a sudden we started to get really nice positive results from the other therapy in leaps and bounds compared to yeah. what we did before. And after this happened many, many times, all of a sudden we understand that when the internal fear has been diminished or reduced enough, all of a sudden the person feels more comfortable, uh, they're more bold, and they can do things that they couldn't do before. And you know what? We're never going to talk down those therapies because they've got a place. Yeah. But I think the therapy that you and I do really deals with the subconscious fear so that the other therapies can do their good work. Because, Felix, yeah. if this was a logical problem, we wouldn't have any clients, right? Yeah. Because they yeah, would have solved exactly. it themselves. Yeah, yeah. This, this is it. In, in the military, they call it a force amplifier. So what we do, the therapy is aimed at a breakthrough, breaking that wall where you can eat food. Now, personally, I can't be bothered to see somebody half an hour every week and do a food plan and do, you know, that's not what my interests lie. I, I'm really into the breakthrough stuff. Other people are good at that. Other people are more methodical, systematic. You know, I like the breakthrough section, as do you. And this will really act as a catalyst for that, this force amplifier. Um, which leads to the next question, maintaining momentum after therapy, uh, managing expectations at the rate of change and goals. So, okay. Uh, this is the problem with some children. Children prematurely think, I'm cured, you know? And, uh, you know, I've, I've been asked to eat your food, I've eaten my food, I've discharged my duties now. Um, so I had this case of this 12-year-old girl at the time, uh, nice, very pleasant, very affable, little chubby girl, who only ate um, chicken schnitzel and um, fries. And, you know, she her favorite food and she loved it. And I'm saying, well, you know, a little bit worried about her health in the future and like her to eat some food. The therapy worked like a dream. She ate absolutely everything. Very pleasant, very affable girl. The mum phones me and says, um, she's sort of gone back to eating chicken, snitch and pastel. I'll give her a new food. She'll take one bite, say, can I have my pasta and fries now? You know, uh, my, my, my chicken, snitch and fries now and pasta. And you think, okay, you're, you're sort of missing the spirit of the therapy. It's not... I've done what you've asked. I've eaten one food, one piece of any food. Can I have my nice favorite food? That's not what we're saying. You're missing the, 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 the bigger picture, which is this diet, as fun as it is, is unhealthy and I need to do something. So it's about ownership, taking responsibility, which obviously is going to be harder for a child than for an adult. You know, I've got two young kids. Getting them to be responsible for cleaning their room, their home, their everything is an ongoing challenge, you know, and, you know, and one's 14. So it's not easy with kids to say to them, this is your health, what you get in, you get out, and you need to do this for you. You know, it's not just an ARFID problem, it's, it's a developmental problem. Um, so it, it's pointing that out to a child. It's I'm not just saying, have a bite, then do what you did before. That's not what this therapy is about. Um, and, and, you know, it sounds obvious, but they, they kind of need it spelled out. Yeah. They, they don't make the connection. I yeah. agree. I think, um, and what we're talking about here after therapy is advice that you and I can certainly give clients, but there are also other therapies out there that can help them on that journey once that fear is diminished. What One thing I, I found that which is quite beneficial is, you know what, we've got to find out what motivates the child. Like if the child mm. is a, a soccer player or, or they do ballet yeah. and occasionally there's a pizza night or, 
or the, the crew goes out for something to eat, you know, let's find out what they can't eat that their friends are eating. And maybe that's the thing that we can work towards. So have a meaningful goal for the child, not just yes. food in general, but something they're going to get some pleasure out of. Yeah. And that, that's why we always ask, you know, what are your activities, what are your hobbies, what are your interests, and try and connect um, pleasure and gain to that because they'll be meaningful. So you, you might say, you know, to a child who thinks smoking is cool, you know, smoking is bad. They go, nah, I'm young, I'm immortal, I'm invincible. If you go, you know, you're a swimmer, aren't you? How would you like to have 20% better lung capacity? That can make a big difference in swimming. Yeah. Now the child's interested and motivated. Yeah. So yeah. it's about, you know, getting that hook in. Um, just to, for them to see that benefit and the problem is Glenn that um, and I'm going to give the game away here but when a child's nine or ten and they think you know what why do I have to change today I want to change but why go through the work and therefore doing it today I mean my parents love me they're going to make me some food tonight my favorite food even if it's unhealthy yep. they, they won't let me starve yeah and you know I've got plenty of time I can change at 10 years old or 11 or 12 I'll change in five years and the problem is they're not really wrong. They can. There's no pressing reason unless they have one. Yep. So it is a bit of a big challenge to say to a child, I'd like you to take on some effort and pay now for some unspecified benefit in the future. You know, that's quite a grown up thing to ask a child. Yep. Yep. That's why the success rate is lower because the buy in, skin in the game, is not as much as an adult. Yep. And an adult really understands this because they've lived the consequences already. They think, yeah, I don't want that. And they're self funding. So, um, yeah, th this is when they say, you know, and I don't want to sound defensive, but when people say the therapy didn't work for my child, it's not, it's not really accurate to say that. The therapy works when these conditions are in place. Yeah. Um, the cognitive issues, uh, the buy-in, the motivation, it's not a medication that works or does not work. Yeah. And that's the thing we've just got to keep repeating. Um, and also on this point, you know, often when people, you know, um, you see, you see, you know, 6,000 people, there's going to be people that have different expectations. They, they expect it to work like the magic wand on TV. And they'll say, I had one session with Glenn or Felix. It didn't work. Nothing changed. Saying, okay, did you try two sessions? Yeah. Oh, no. I expected to work in one. So you want the magic wand again. And you're disappointed we didn't get the magic wand. Have you ever gone to psychologists, psychotherapists, and everyone else going, I want one session, my child to eat food? No. Why would it be different here? It's a process. And if you can understand everything in one session, fantastic. Uh, older people do, uh, older teenagers and adults do. But if you need more time to process what's being said, then that's important. You know, you need more time. Yeah. You need more than one session. It can't be done for you in one session. Um, so it's realistic expectations as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah Felix, this is uh, slightly off topic, but I think it's so important to talk about you know, parents come and say, you know, what, what can I do? Um, I can't get my child to eat. Now, you're going to be honest and say, yes, you need to go to the GP and get all the medical advice that you need to look <laughs> after your child. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But at the end of the day, um, of the many thousands of children that we've seen, I'm always staggered at how a child can maintain weight or maintain health on the very small amount of food that they eat. The human body is yeah. extraordinarily good at, at extracting nutrients. So I'm going to say this, and I know you'll speak to it as well. Yeah. You know what? If the child is too young for the therapy at the moment, keep feeding yeah. them what they can eat in the quantities that they can eat. You need to suspend judgment from other parents. They don't have a child with an eating disorder. And you yeah. need to go to the school and say, my child has an eating disorder and your lunchbox is going to look different to every other child's lunchbox. At the moment, yeah. before your child is ready for change, feed them what they can in the quantities that are good, suspend judgment yeah. from other people and just hang on. Because I tell you, I've never met a person yet who said, I want to hang on to this Arford for the rest of my life. They just don't yeah. exist, right? So your child yeah. is going to be ready at some point to make the change. The good news is there is help available when they are ready. Yeah. And you know, what I'm saying to both adults and children at the moment is, look, you're coming here thinking some kind of exam, like Felix or Glenn will do the medical thing, the hypnosis thing, and hopefully it'll work. And we keep saying it's a process. Forget about the result. Right now, this is about learning. This is a learning curve for you. Now, what I'm going to explain is actually relatively simple if you're not distracted by all these other things. So when you take on board, you can direct your brain to make the changes you want. Yeah. 
So it depends. If you're good enough at listening, good enough at being open and, and understanding, you can change one session. Yeah. But at the same time, um, you know, th think of this as a learning experience. How how um, you can learn how to use your brain. Forget everything else. But they still treat it understandably like a bit of an exam. I hope this works. Rather than well, it's a learning curve. You know, or, or explaining what works. So that's quite important. Point two. Yeah, absolutely. We come back. Yeah. I've got another question, uh, Glenn. Um, feedback from people who try food but don't like it. What can they do to like food? And you mentioned an anecdote with this uh, Indian boy. Um, I'm, I'm going to share. That's politically incorrect, Felix. But of course, you're quite right. Oh, I, I do can have I a, say that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell a boy the story. Of the far of, of the Asian. Yeah, 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 correct. It could be anybody, but it happened to be a fantastic young Indian boy that I worked with a number of years ago now, and. and I think this story is good for a number of reasons. It's good for perspective and how sometimes when we get shown something, we can get locked on it and not take yeah. the next step. So this boy came in and he had the session. And at the end of the session, he tried some food. He didn't like some of it. He liked some of it. Nice breakthrough. Mum was so happy because he'd never even yeah. put that food in his mouth. And I thought, terrific. And I, I sort of suggested to him, look, here's a sheet. Would you mind just writing one food per day, just a new food, yeah. just to start to get the momentum going, and then I'd love to see you again. Anyway, uh, about two or three weeks later, the mum calls me and said, you know what, Glenn, uh, I don't think things are going well. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, what's the story? She said, you know what, he's tried 25 foods since he saw you, but he's just tried mm -hmm. them once, he's written them, and he hasn't tried them again. I said, bring him back in, we'll have a chat. So he came in, mm -hmm. and I, I said to him, how's it going? He said, I'm doing really well. Look at this, he held up the sheet. I've tried 25 things. I said, fantastic. I said, did you try them again? He said, no, I just tried them once. I said, okay, yeah. I knew we loved cricket. So I said, do you bat or do you bowl? He said, I I'm a bowler. I said, how did you get good at bowling? He said, I go down to the nets, the practice nets, and I bowl every lunchtime, I bowl after school. I said, here's a funny question. Why do you practice bowling in the nets? He looked at me like I dropped out of a tree and he said, Glenn, I practice bowling in the nets so I get good at bowling. I said, you know what? I don't think that's the true answer. I mm. said, why do you think you really practice bowling in the nets? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. If that's not the answer, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you why. You practice bowling in the net so you get good at bowling so you can go and play a game with your mates and you're a fantastic bowler. You have the camaraderie. He said, oh yeah, of course. I said to him, imagine if you just practice bowling in the nets for the rest of your life. Would that make you happy? He said, no, that'd be boring. And I held up the sheet and I said, this sheet is like practicing bowling in the nets. You're getting so good at it. I'd like you to take that to the main game, which is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now for that boy, that shift was enough for him to say, oh, uh, okay. Took yeah. his focus off trying to really focus on what the trying was all about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I've just seen a bunch of requests from people, I think from your forum. <laughs> Oh, I just don't, I can't multitask, but I just have to watch the replay. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, yeah, I, I think expecting to like foods instantly is unrealistic. Yeah. And, and yet we still hear it time and time again. Um, a lot of children want the easy, I eat it, I didn't love it, so I won't try it again. And you think, well, you know, as you said, that there is an element of you've got to try, you know, five to 10, 15 times for the taste buds to kick in. Now, there's very, very happily, um, a lot of cases where, you know, on the videos that go on YouTube, you see people eat a food for the first time and love it. There's no adjustment of taste buds needed, yep. no acclimatization. They love it instantly. Uh, but a lot of foods you may need to try 5, 10, 15 times in different ways. It doesn't have to be the same way. And this is the work part of our food, you know. And I say to people, you know, our food involves taste buds getting used to stuff. If you have a fear of spiders, you don't need a pet spider, but you do need to activate your taste buds. And now you know you can, you don't have that crippling fear in the way. This is the work part of it. Yeah. But only trying foods that you love is unrealistic. You, you're not only going to do a job that you love 100%. You know, in my job, there's 20% accounting and 10% emails. You know, I don't like that bit. Yeah. There's no job that's 100 well, realistically, one job that's 100% perfect. But we do it because yeah. of the benefits of everything else. Yeah. Um, so this is a bit of a, a, a life lesson. Um, that it's not all going to be beautiful and easy, you know, handed to you on a plate. You yeah. know, if you sometimes got to strive and work for things and make them the way you want. So here's a couple of things, Felix, so, on that note. You know, yeah. I think it's always nice to think of, yeah, if I go to the gym for one day, do I look yeah. like Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, it doesn't happen. 
And you know what? Our yeah. taste buds are like those muscles, right? No one's expecting the client to be Arnold Schwarzenegger of eating on the first day. It might take yeah. a little while for them to get stronger and tougher. Here's an interesting analogy. Um, a number of years ago, um, you know, focused on healthy eating. And I thought, you know what, Glenn, maybe kale is the way to go. And maybe almond milk is the way to go. I'm going to share with you that if you've ever tried to eat kale and you've had almond milk for the first time, man, they're really in interesting flavors and it wasn't the best <laughs> thing in the world. It took me a little while of persevering before my yeah. taste buds could adjust to it because I had the reason to get off cow's milk. There was a real sort of drive behind it. Yeah. And now I find it really hard to go back to cow's milk because my you know, my taste buds have got that new flavor. And, and I share with clients, and I know you do as well, Felix, that you know yeah. what, it takes a little while, but if you've got a reason for doing it and you persevere, then the change is possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you just remind me of an anecdote I used to use, you know, the same age my wife says to me, you're getting a little bit tubby, you should really go back to the gym, you should go to the gym instead of sitting on the sofa all day. So finally, after months of nagging, I go to the gym and she thinks, great, and I come back, and, you know, a week goes by, two weeks go by, so when are you going to the gym again? And so, well, what do you mean again? I've been to the gym. You tell me go to the gym, I've been to the gym. It's not a sort of one-off thing. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, it's kind of like a way of life now until exactly. it's, or, or it's something you do until you make the changes and they set and then you yep. maintain them. This yep. is exactly what's needed here uh, yep. with food. But they think it's this one-off going to the gym equivalent. And, you know, I'm afraid it's not. Um, I think for so, younger children, you know, if they don't connect with the gym, I certainly connect with it. They might connect with learning a musical instrument for the first time. And how crazy yeah. would it be to throw the guitar down and say, I've tried it once. I'm a failure at yeah. guitar. I mean, you know, yeah. we know it's a process. We've just got to stick at it five minutes a day. And then yeah. something magical happens, Felix. All of a sudden, we stop thinking about it with our head here. And it yeah. goes into our unconscious here. We don't know when that's going to happen. And the same thing happens with food. If we continually yeah. just turn up and try, at some point in time, that inner part says, oh, is this what you want me to do? I've got it now. Leave it to me. I'm, I've got it. So we, we've got yeah. to persevere until it sinks in. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I do want to make the point because in terms of realistic expectations, um, a parent might come in thinking, you're going to see this man. He's going to do this magic. And, you know, I expect my child to love food. And I was really disappointed when they didn't. And you think, you know, to be honest with you, there's enough work in the session because it's a high energy performance, like a matinee performance. We've been said this to us before. Um, doing the breakthrough is enough of, of a challenge. Yeah. Um, getting them to love food and everything is, is the second bit. We can't all do in one lesson a session and get them to love food and get them to be motivated and everything else. I mean, this is what being a child is. It's a struggle to motivate my children to do their homework and everything, clean their room. You know, it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's the age old thing about a child is kind of avoids pain and pursues pleasure. You know, they're, they're very um, at the most primitive basic level like that. And and a child can also be, even if we've seen them, they can still be fussy. Yeah. You, know, you, you can still be fussy and not have our fit. You can still be a little bit picky about what you like, about what you do. It doesn't mean all the problems are magically solved, you know, with this hypnosis that we're going to do in a person. So it's getting that realistic expectation in place. Yeah. The aim of the therapy is to do a breakthrough to get through that crippling fear so you can taste foods now. Now, keep up that momentum. You know, if you want another therapist, we'll guide you through a food plan and hold your hand. Great. They're cheaper than me. Um, but we've broken that wall. That's the aim of therapy. It's not to love every food from now on. Um, so. Felix, can I just, I just touch to base it. on that interesting point yeah. you just brought up? I always suggest to my Arford clients, hey, imagine you're walking into a cafe or a restaurant and you're looking around mm. and you're seeing everybody and they've got food in front of them. What do you think they're thinking about the food? Most Arford people will say they're all loving the food. So we, mm. we can sort of backtrack a little bit and say, you know what? Some, that girl over there in the corner, she ordered a sandwich. It wasn't really what she wanted, and she took a bite of it. It wasn't the yeah. best in the world, but she's on a short time frame, so she knows she's got to eat it so she doesn't get tired later. That guy yeah. over there, he got the wrong order, but it turned out to be a little bit better. So I suggest to everybody that some people are having a 9 or 10 experience, not many. Most of them yeah. are having between a 4 and a 7 experience with food, yeah. some less. Yeah. So the expectation is... For the Arford person, every time I try food, it really should be a nine or 10 out of uh, 10 experience. Yeah. In fact, that's not the case for anybody. Yeah. It's okay to have a four out of 10 experience and keep going.
Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That, that's a really good point, which I mentioned as well sometimes is that, you know, if I go to a place, they don't have what I usually like, I go, all right, I'll, I'll have that instead. It's just lunch. That's lunch taken care of. Yeah. And it's a level four or five experience. It's not my favorite variation of the sandwich I want, but it'll do. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's that also, that's a real life, life lesson as well. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to love it to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, um, because, you know, I feel that, that you know, if people think, you know, that the next job I do, I want it to pay a lot of money, I want it to be really fulfilling and very rewarding. It's like, I'm not sure the world works that way unless you have one of the minority of jobs that, you know, can, can offer all those things. It's a bit like, you know, you work up to that job. You know, I didn't love my first placement in the NHS, you know, and, and the second one. Um, but as I worked on my life more and more, I got to do exactly the kind of thing I wanted, but it didn't start off that way. You yeah, know, you, you build up to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's have a quick look. How to go from small bites to eating normally after therapy. Um, you know, th this is just another version of a lack of trust around food. Whether lack of trust is uh, texture, color, the sound of it crunching. Uh, this is about quantity this time, which just, again, it's indicative of there's still some residual fear in the background saying, oh, okay, that's enough now. Uh, if you eat more than that, you're pushing your luck. That's still too much fear present. So, um, you know, there's layers of fear. In a session, a child might say, or an adult, okay, fine, I'll eat this, and I'll eat that kind of food, I'll eat this food, but I still don't trust it fundamentally, it's only a little bit of it. It's indicative yeah. of lack of trust. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with that, and I think there's another yeah. layer on top of that. I, I think, uh, absolutely, there's still some fear there that needs to be worked on. But I also think that sometimes people have lost sight of their goals. Uh, and isn't that yeah. an interesting thing? When we forget why we're doing something, it's very easy to go back to the old behavior. So yeah. it's really nice for the clients to have such a strong reason for wanting the change. Because you know what? It's like any journey in life. We're going to hit a rough patch from time to time. And if we know why yeah. we're on the journey, it just keeps us motivated. So yes, there's the fear that might need to be helped removed, but the client can also keep the goals in mind to keep them going over those little rough patches. Yeah. So next question, Glenn, is ASD, Autistic Spectrum Disorder. Will it work if my child uh, is on the spectrum? Over to you, the elephant okay. in the room. Um, I know there are a lot of people on um, uh, the forum, this forum and the other forums that we run uh, whose children have been diagnosed as on spectrum in some regard. And, you know, as we talk openly and honestly here, those numbers are really seem to be increasing. And, and I did a calculation on some files uh, the other week. There was uh, about 12% of the clients that I see, uh, their parents have said to me that their child is on spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that's not accounting for the children who haven't been diagnosed as well. W what I found with uh, children that come in on spectrum, it really it does make a difference on where they sit, and I'll explain that. Uh, there have been some parents whose child is nonverbal. Uh, that is a challenge yeah. for our type of therapy, and I'll, I'll have to say that our type of therapy is probably not suited to that type of child. However, most of the uh, ASD children and adults that I see, that is not the case for them. Uh, they're in mainstream schooling, the vast majority of them, and they respond equally well to the therapy yeah. as non-ASD clients. So yeah. uh, in fact, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and say, because the focus of attention can sometimes be more refined with, with some uh, ASD. And of course, uh, ASD yeah. is not a, it's just a different way of connecting with the world. It's no worse mm. or better. It's just a different way of connecting. But if that child really connects with the stories and metaphors and what I'm saying, I've got to be honest, sometimes in 20 minutes, the work is done. In fact, I had one child say to me after about 25 mm -hmm. minutes, um, excuse me, Glenn, can I eat food now? And, and I thought to myself, oh, goodness, I've got another half an hour to go. Uh, just let me get through the other half yeah. an hour. But that connection had already been made and the change yeah. was done. So for yeah. whether it's ASD or not, if the person grabs the fundamentals and they say, oh, I get that now, then the change happens. So uh, Felix, on that point, I don't think it really matters whether the client has ASD or not. For you or I, yeah. I don't think that matters. Yes, 
Um, I, I know you've been told in the past, don't use metaphors. We've got to use yeah. different language. I don't see that. We, we, everybody yeah. is the same from the therapy we provide and they have the opportunity of having the same positive result. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, this has been a massive learning curve for me because I'm, I'm self-taught. And, and the, the, the positive of that is I didn't have interfering theory in the way. And the, the few times I did, it got blown out of the water. So um, when I started this, you know, 14 years ago, um, I, I had my approach. And, I, you know, I, I, was, I didn't think it through about every, all the possibilities. So uh, a mother comes in with a 12 or 30 year old boy and says, uh, OK, here's, here's Johnny. And by the way, he's autistic. I hope that's okay. And I'm think, sitting there thinking, oh no, well, wait a minute. Uh, I don't have a plan B. I should have thought of that. Um, my therapy is full of metaphors, analogies, everything that apparently children on the spectrum can't process. I didn't know what else to do. I did my therapy and much to my surprise, he ate all the food. And actually he was quite a good candidate. So I'm sitting there thinking, but, but I, you should not be able to process what I've said. And then I do it again. Yeah, with a child, you know, I've got a child on the spectrum. Can you help him? Well, I've helped one child, so maybe I can help this one, but I don't know. And then that child did really well. Yeah. So I'm beginning to think, well, maybe metaphors, analogies, maybe that's a myth. Maybe they can process some essence, some meaning about this that we are told they can't. So as long as now I have seen a couple of uh, pre-screened, highly um, autistic children that wouldn't work with this approach because yes. they're really high. Uh, on the spectrum, but if you're sort of high functioning Asperger's on the spectrum, then, then this has been proven to work. Yeah, Adults I agree. And teenagers. Yeah. Yep, I agree. So, next question. Other approaches, family based therapy or FBT, uh, CBT, why they're not as effective? Um, I, I, I sort of, I do my own thing. I, you know, I, I, I pursue my approach because it's working, it's got the results I want. I don't, you know, um, so I, I'm involved in that. Um, Glenn, because you're sort of newer to this, you're also looking around, seeing what other people are doing and still going to talks about, you know, CBT and this, whereas I've said, you know, I'm doing my own thing. So you're more aware of the alternatives. Um, so perhaps you can let us know your experience of attending other you know, talks and things like that. Yeah, well, um, happy to do that. Um, I'm going to touch on FBT to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. And there have been some questions on the forum mm -hmm. about FBT, uh, I noticed in the last week or two. Uh, mm -hmm. FBT is a family based treatment or the Maudsley method. And, and really, it's been used successfully for the treatment of anorexia. And really, what it is, it's three main meals, three snacks, uh, supervised. It's a refeeding program to make sure that the, the person, whether the child or adult, gets enough nutrients mm. in their body. Now, when we're talking about ARFID, you know, that's a completely different challenge. I'm gonna say it right yeah. up front, that FBT is not the therapy that will help ARFID. Yeah. It's no good yeah. locking somebody in to eat food. Now, if, you tr if your child with ARFID is undernourished, if they are malnourished, then maybe uh, you need to go and see a GP and maybe some sort of feeding regime is required of the food that they can eat. But very yeah. often with the FBT for ARFID, there's a range of foods that people can't eat that re-traumatizes the client. So no, FBT is not the approach for ARFID, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Here's another interesting thing. We touched on it earlier, CBT. And in, and in fact, in more recent times, there's CBT uh, AR. So it's the, uh, the ARFID approach to CBT. CBT yeah. has its place and it is very good for anxiety and behavioral issues. But I believe, my personal opinion is it misses the mark on phobia. And ARFID yeah. is typically a very strong phobia. So yes. CBT has a component of um, exposure therapy. It has a, a, its main course of action is logic. Okay, if you don't eat that, you're gonna get malnourished. If you don't eat that, you and people know that. Our clients know yeah. all of that logically, and they say, yeah, I get that, but I still can't eat. So I think, and the feedback from my clients is CBT is a long road. Now, I went to a lecture with a couple of um, doctors came out from the States, and there was 40 to 50 sessions of CBT. I'm really careful, because people will be viewing this who have come from yeah. all different walks. I'm, I'm not uh, being negative on CBT. I am saying yeah. that 50 sessions of CBT to finally get someone to pop something small into their mouth is a really hard road to follow 
when yeah. you can come and have the phobic response reduced and get on that path far quicker. So yeah, that's my yeah. Point. I totally agree. I mean, it, it's, you know, this works, this approach was developed for our Fed. Um, it's <clears throat> highly effective with our Fed compared to anything else because it's a very specialized approach. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I grew it organically with the feedback I was getting from our Fed. So it's all about our Fed, which I then applied to other phobias, which works really well. But it is, you know, I think the premier approach for phobias. Yeah. Um, whether it's our fit, I've had a lot of success with animal phobias and things like that as well. So, okay. Um, Felix, so, can we just talk about one more thing uh, just before yeah. we go? You've just talked about phobias, which also brings up to me clients come in with other similar phobias, emetophobia, for example, uh, which is mm. the fear of, of vomiting or, or hearing mm. somebody vomit or talk about vomit. And sometimes yeah. it's very easy for people to get confused between emetophobia and ARFID. Uh, sometimes when we see someone with the ARFID trying a non-safe food, they have a very, very strong gag reflex and people yeah. mix that up for emetophobia. Emetophobia can sometimes be standalone and it can be something Sorry. that happened to the client and all of a sudden they just have this phobic response to smelling vomit, hearing it, talking about it, and they might be able to eat a range of food. Typically with emetophobia, it's also food preparation and germs, a lot of other things yeah. come into that. So. Interestingly enough, uh, the therapy that we use for ARFID can be applied to emetophobia, maybe yeah. one or two sessions, but it's certainly along the same lines. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, since we're on top of emetophobia, just FYI, it might not be the right place, but th there is a difference in some of the clients who have emetophobia compared with ARFID. The ARFID clients are easier. They'll often say, I'm quite a daredevil and everything else apart from food. Yeah. But their metaphobic tends not to be. They tend to be highly anxious about everything. And I've noticed the pattern. I've seen a lot of emetophobics in their early 20s and mid 20s. And they're very childlike in the sense that <clears throat> they have a problem like, make this go away for me. Uh, taking responsibility for, for their own insight and understanding is not that their thing. They want this thing to go, they want other people to handle it. There's often an issue about growing up as I've explored it take responsibility, whereas an alpha client may have none of that. Yes. They, they may have some. <laughs> but typically, that's nothing to do with alpha, but presents quite a lot with emetophobia. There's this extra layer of self-esteem building work and resilience and self-coping that a lot of people in alpha are absolutely you know, uh, brilliant at everything else in their life, apart from the food. So um, just FYI. So we come back to, so I'm trying to multitask and see if they can use questions. Um, yeah, we're going to end, Glenn, with um, sorry, how this approach works, although I've, I've just realized we've been saying it on and off. But, you know, just to recap, um, we've taken the knowledge from hypnosis, but it's not hypnosis. Um, it's not, certainly not formal hypnosis. There's a lot of indirect approaches. Um, and people say, oh, I, I don't trust myself, so can you hypnotize me and make me food? No, but I can show you how to do this with your brain that's self-empowering and it becomes a, 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 a seed change, a, a grassroots change because it's coming from you. It's better if I show you how to do it and you learn to do it and you give yourself the credit, then I'm some kind of drug pusher that does this thing onto you that you need you know, recurring um, hits of. So um, it's an indirect approach. We know how to speak with a part of the subconscious mind, even with your eyes open, to build a good working relationship, to get you to work with it. We break that barrier. Uh, but we're going to show you how it's not the magic wand. It can seem like a magic wand when you have a good client. You have a good client and good therapy, you've got a marriage made in heaven. Yep. But sometimes if you have a client that struggles with other things, the therapy will need more work. Uh, there's more work to do. Uh, you need an element of effort and persistence. Um, if your taste buds need to wake up, you know, there's an element of knuckling down and doing the work now that you know what to do. So I think that needs to be made clear as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I might add, so, on, add that on a, a yeah. little bit. And of course, you know, people are listening to this. And I'm sure they're thinking this right now. Gee, Glenn and Felix have been talking, but they really haven't told us what the therapy is all about. It's very <laughs> difficult to explain. But I think in broad brushstroke, it's exactly what you've said. But here it is. There's, a, there's an element of education. Now, it's not a general education. Most of the clients that Felix and I see, it's a really specific education. And for the first yeah. time, I think for most clients, they say, oh, is that what my brain and body is doing around food? So that's, that's yeah. an important step. The next step is, you know, it's okay to know what your brain and body is doing, 
But you know what? We're going to gently show you how you can talk to it and how we can negotiate with it and we can get it to change. And, and Felix, yeah. I think you'll agree with me. I don't think anybody anywhere in the world gets anywhere by fighting. So you know what? Yeah. This therapy is not about fighting you. It's about giving you the opportunity to work together. And when the client finally gets it and understands that something in their body is trying to do something for them just in an odd way, and they, we can turn that around, the change happens. And yeah. you know what? People talk about hypnotherapy, and we're both uh, hypnotherapists. Yes, there is an element of relaxation, but my goodness me, I've had so many uh, young boys and girls do pirouettes and cartwheels and crawl under chairs in my office yeah. That, yeah. and keep their eyes open. So for most children, you know, the, the hypnotherapy part is really just me consolidating what's happened. It's not important exactly. for the change. For exactly. adults, no, they have a slightly different experience, but again, it's a nice to have, but it's the way that we package the information and talking to the client that makes the change the hypnosis is not the important ingredient. Yeah, um, you know, this is a hard thing for some people to really appreciate because we're saying it's not always what we do that's important, but it's also how it's done. Because, you know, they think, well, you know, if it's like an injection, it doesn't matter, you know, who injects, you just get the injection. But this therapy has a lot of other dynamics and factors that will, will take hours and hours to go over. You have to be a therapist to really appreciate what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but th there's a lot going on here. It doesn't rely on this thing that everybody thinks it does. Yeah. It's quite important. Um, and I appreciate why people say, well, what is it then? You know, um, it, it's kind of hard to say. There's a lot of things working together to educate, to lead that part of the mind. It's not one thing that's done. It's a lot of things building on each other. Um, and, the, you know, I have to say a little bit like, I can't really, ex I don't have time to explain what I do. You know, even a weekend training you and other people wasn't long enough. Um, it, you, you know, you need to trust a little bit, like, do we have good proven track records for this? Then trust us. It's like, I don't really know how a, a pilot flies a plane, but I trust that they know. It's good. There's a little bit of that, like, we know what we're doing here. Um, it's a good track record. Trust that there's things in place happening that you won't fully understand unless you study the subject. Um, I think that's a, that's a beautiful analogy, uh, Felix, and mm. maybe this is a nice place for us to finish in a moment. You know, mm. a, a pilot's got the skills to fly the plane, a therapist, the ARFID therapist, you and I have the skill. However, mm. every ARFID client is different. And when you're a pilot in the plane, weather is different, uh, situations are different, but the skill is getting the plane to the destination. So for the therapist, yeah. there's not one person in front of me with ARFID that is identical to any other person. However, there is a process that we can take them from walking in the office to more than likely experiencing some positive result at the end. That process yeah. is robust and can be adjusted for most clients that come through our door. Yeah, absolutely. And I might, I might just end on one, one thing. I mean, I, I, you and I, we, you know, we, we love this subject. We could talk for hours and hours. So let's do another one. Let's not all overload the poor people. But uh, I get the sensory processing a lot. I mean, here's my thing with diagnoses. Um, they're not always what they purport to be. They say, oh, my son or daughter was diagnosed with sensory processing. And you think it's not that simple because everything is sensory processing. You know, the way we interact with the world is through the senses. And remember, the senses can be hijacked by other stuff, by fear and expectation, anticipation, which distorts everything. So it's not always necessarily just the sensory processing issue. Now, it, there's a spectrum as always, or one other spectrum, there is high levels of actual sensory processing wiring issues, but I found in many other cases, it's not, yeah? Um, we've seen, you know, my YouTube channel, people are terrified of something, gag at the smell of it being the same room, then they're eating the thing and even liking it, yeah? Did I change the senses? You know, no, you know? So I made this quick example, um, if I have a really bad breakup with somebody and they're playing our song and think, turn that off, I can't stand that. Or, oh, Chanel number no. five, that reminds me of her. Have I got a sensory processing disorder to Chanel number no. five, but not other perfume? You know, I don't think so. There's baggage in that that's distorting my perception of songs or perfumes or um, red hair or blonde hair or whatever the case may be. So if you get rid of that baggage, you're back to being neutral. And that's the name of this therapy. Um, so I can't tell you and I can't tell people up front is a sensory processing. I don't know. All I can do is let's get rid of as much fear as possible, see what happens. That's how this approach works. 
you know, I can't give you answers up front. We get rid of as much, see what's left. You may be surprised as well. I've seen time and time again, um, often were surprised. So I'm trying to find any last minute questions, but I, I think what we might do, Glenn, is we might uh, go over some of the questions asked and then do another one of these and hopefully we'll figure out how to do it on the same screen on this version. But um, yeah, I've got a lot of uh, nice comments there. So I hope uh, this has been useful and um, you know, raising that awareness of our fit is always uh, our pet passion. So uh, great, then we'll put our heads together and uh, we'll do another one of these, to explore some more topics. Absolutely. But otherwise, absolutely. Uh, yeah, any comments, questions, um, do write them below. And and this will be going out um, to all our forums. Yeah. Okay, yeah, definitely. And, pos and possibly YouTube. I, I think uh, I don't think anyone's name is going to pop up. I just did a first name a couple of times, so it's okay. So, thank you very much, and until the next time. Pleasure. Thank you.